Welcome everybody to the first ABA workshop. Um, we'll be looking at quotes and apostrophes in Word and Duxbury um, with Cathy Reeson as our presenter. Um, so the session should go for around an hour. We'll also have question time at the end of that. Um, also, there were documents circulated prior to the workshop. Um, those are still available for download if you don't have them already on the Australian Braille Authority website, which we've got the link to, so it's braillestraily.org. If you just go to news, it's the top item there. Um, those will allow you to read along as we're going, um, or you don't, they're not necessary, but it's just if you want to work along um, and do it interactively along with Cathy. So I wanted to say um, a very warm welcome to everybody and thank you to Cathy for leading this initiative. So this is our first ever ABA online workshop. It was motivated because we were not able to have a workshop as part of Roundtable this year. We will have one next year, of course. Um, and hopefully this will be something that we continue on even as we go back to face-to-face -face things. It's uh, a nice way to have everyone able to attend. Um, and if you've got any ideas about future workshops that you'd like to attend or that you think you could present, please do let us know. Um, okay, so Kathy is hopefully not needing too much introduction. She is the production coordinator at South Australia School for Vision Impaired. Uh, she is a member of the Australian Braille Authority Executive. I didn't count how many documents and workshops she has presented for us or um, edited because there's a lot of them. She's very knowledgeable um, and always one to be trying to solve problems and come up with technical um, solutions to things. So we're really lucky to have her with us. Oh, and of course, she is the new chair for the Code Maintenance Committee for Unified English Braille internationally as well. So um, thank you very much, Cathy, and over to you. So welcome. Now let's see if I can get this computer to work. Uh, you should be able to see on the screen the first slide of my PowerPoint. So, no, to the. Ah, there we go. So, as the rules for quotes and apostrophes changed in October last year, uh, and the Duxbury Braille Translator DBT has not yet been updated since then. Uh, so some of this information today may actually need to be, may be able to be modified once it is update, once they are updated. But in a, in a nutshell, we no longer use the term non-specific quote to define the single cell quote. Single and double quotes have their own defined braille representation. Given that. There is rule 764, which allows for the assignment of single and double quotes to be swapped. Um, current publishers in Australia tend to use a single quote as the, as the primary quote. And it is recommended that in these instances, we swap the assignment of single and double quotes so that the most frequently used quote is the single cell form, creating braille with less clutter. Apostrophes remain unchanged and are represented using dot three. So that's just a summary of what the new rules mean. So if, if we look at typing, when you're using word and typing with smart quotes, they will automatically choose when you're typing and you've got smart quotes on, they automatically choose the direction for the quote. It'll be an opening quote if it's before a letter and a closing quote after any character. It is possible to force the direction or force the straight version of a quote as you type. I'm gonna to go to a blank word document to give some, uh, to give a demonstration of what happens. Which okay. 
I'll tr I will I will tr endeavour to talk this through for those um, for whom uh, those who can't see the screen. I will try and be as descriptive as I possibly can. But apologies if I miss miss some things. So. The first example I'm going to give is a double quote immediately followed by a single quote. If I type it, the double quote, I get an opening double quote. Then when I press the single, I get a closing single quote. That will not trans... And then let's say... And I've typed the word what immediately following. To force two opening ones, I'll type the double quote a space, the single quote, and it is now an opening single quote. Go back, remove the space, and voila, you get the correct direction. Second example is where you've got an apostrophe at the beginning of a word. Uh, my word is Ari apostrophe A -R -R -Y, being short for Harry. If I type it without any intervention, I get the opening, it, it types as an opening quote. Duxbury will translate that as an opening single quote. If I want it to translate as apostrophe, there are two things I could do. I can do the quote, a second quote, <laughs> take out the first quote, Harry, which means that the, at the beginning of the word, you've got a closing quote, which Duxbury will translate. The alternative is, quote, press control Z immediately, which will force the straight version, Harry. So you can uh, control how smart quotes Are on that. So summing up, to force an open quote, you but you put a space before the quote and then remove the space if needed. To force a closed quote, you type two quotes and then remove the first. And to force a straight apostrophe, you type the apostrophe and immediately cancel the smart quote with Control Z. So. What does, DB, what does DBDT do? Turn the page. It assigns a one cell quote to the first quote encountered, whether it is single or double. If it's a single quote, if it encounters a single quote, it will then use the dot phi form of the double quote, which is now incorrect in this context. If a single quote is the first quote encountered and the code UOQ tilde double quote is put at the beginning of the document, that will translate direct correctly, but the most frequent quote will be a two cell quote. If a double quote is the first quote encountered in a document, you will get co correct translation. That's a summary of, of how DBT will handle. I've got a little file up on the screen, which has got the three scenarios. The same, the same passage, but with three scenarios. First scenario, single quote, double quote, but he was, double quote, shouted, hoof, sir, full stop, double quote, he was singing, space, single quote, oh, slugger moon, oh, slugger moon, oh, grant, dash, single quote, double quote, single quote. So now I've got the first scenario where the single quote is the first quote encountered. And if I look on the Braille side, I get opening quote, one cell, 
two sell double quote, which is a four, a four, five open quote. That is not what I want. The second example, I've cancelled, I've cancelled it. And the first quote encountered is a single quote, then followed by a double quote, but the code UOQ, but the Hold on. Right, but the but but I have used that quote UOQ tilde double quote to say that I want single quote the double quote to be the one who uses a single cell, so we get single quote, two cells, double quote, the double quote, one cell, which is exactly which is strictly to the rules. The third example, scenario three, in the Word document, I swapped around the double quotes and the single quotes so that we now get a single cell for the double quote and a two cell for the single quote, but using, for the inner quote, but using the dot six form, which is correct. So the scenario two and three are the two which meet the current uh, rules. But, and three is, is if you follow rule 764, which allows for the swapping of the single and double. So okay, I was just looking at what Hattie has written on, on, the, on the notes. So, that, that is what Duxbury does. What Duxbury does with, with apostrophes, it will relate, it will translate a closing single quote followed by a letter as an apostrophe. So this means if it's a closing single quote at the beginning of a word or, or in the middle of a word, it will always translate as an apostrophe. Duxbury always translates the straight apostrophe as dot three. That's a really powerful one to use, but that if you want to know that you're going to get an apostrophe, you use the straight, the straight version. It translates the opening single quote at the beginning of a word as a quote, a closing single quote at the end of a word as a quote. Change so the closing, so the two scenarios which which do require looking at manual intervention is an apostrophe required at the beginning of a word or an apostrophe acquired at the end of the word. They are the two, the two uh, scenarios where you've got to look very carefully at what is the meaning? Does it mean an apostrophe or does it mean a, a single quote? There, and, and, and as a transcriber, that is what you've got to keep in mind. And that's not UEB specific. That, was, that has always been the case with Braille. So when you're working with documents, transcribers traditionally have not used smart quotes and have been advised to use straight quotes and then use the graph for single quotes. So I'm just checking my notes. Smart quotes is the default that is used in Word. And given that we very rarely, we, well, I very rarely now type a document which is going into Braille. I usually get a document from an external source. They will invariably have used some form of smart quotes in that document structure. My experimentation has been that I have found there's no more intervention required if I use smart quotes than if I use straight quotes. I'll do, I will make the statement that if you are typing in directly in the Duxbury Braille Translator, 
in the um, DXP file, you will still need that. Duxbury is a straight quote environment, so you will need to uh, type as, as you would have previously using the graph for single quotes. But if you're typing from scratch, you know, sort of, it's a very different scenario. So, okay, I, I think I've opened the wrong uh, PowerPoint because I did make some changes, so that's okay. <clears throat> when you're working with documents, if a document has been, um, if, if the document you receive has been um, produced where the most frequent quote is the double quote, you re really the main thing that you've got to look at is your single quotes at the beginning and end of, of words. However, that is not the most common. We will have more, more often than not documents that we get use single quotes as the main quote. Okay, the file that you that, that was up on the ABA website was one that I had prepared uh, taking some, some extracts from the novel Watership Down, which has got some lots of single um, complex uh, quotes in it with, and apostrophes. So I consider it was a good one. It has been, it was typed up as the original document. So using single quotes. It's a series of extracts from water. The, the print copy of the novel uses the same symbol for an apostrophe as for a closing single quote. But I've deliberately changed some of the apostrophes at the beginning of words to, um, for demonstration purposes, because often when you get things from teachers, they don't look at direction. They don't, they just type. They don't look at direction, they don't consider it. And so we have got that. So, so we've got some, some quite interesting things. This, so this, this document has a lot of apostrophes with colloquialisms, which is good for testing things out. So the first thing, the first thing that I do and this is an algorithm that I that I use. A lot of this we have got within macros, but I'm going through uh, today. I'm going through it the slow process, so that you can see the thinking behind what we do. The first, the two, there are two main objectives to the macro to to this al algorithm. One is to ensure that the double quote is used for the most, as the most frequent quote in, in Word it has a twofold benefit. One, it gives less cluttered Braille by, you, by swapping the, um, the assignment of single and double quotes. And it minimises the number of single quotes in the document, which makes it much quicker to search for apostrophe letter errors later. I find this, you know, sort of, uh, if, if you have to search through for every instance of a single quote to see if, if it's a, an apostrophe or a quote, minimising the number makes it so much quick, better. It also, uh, and this algorithm also ensures a clean translation because we have a very clear distinction between single quotes and apostrophes. And although Duxbury recognises um, uh, a closing apostrophe at the beginning of a word or in the middle of a word as an apostrophe, I choose to change them to the straight apostrophe just to be absolutely certain. So the first thing, the first thing we do is to convert, is, is to put in straight apostrophes. So we convert all closing single quotes, which are followed by a letter to a straight apostrophe. Okay, going back to, we convert all closing single quotes followed by a letter to a straight apostrophe. So the wildcard search, I, I use a wildcard search for this. 
to define the closing single quote in, in your search string is carat 0146, which is the ASCII number for that character. To define a letter following it is square bracket, capital A hyphen, lowercase z, close square bracket, and then we put parentheses either side of those square brackets. So in, so from my document, I will go control H to bring up my search, find and replace. My find and replace box. So in my find box, before I do anything, it'll usually come up with a small box. Alt M to bring up the more. Alt U, use wildcards. Wildcards means we can talk about a range of characters. Alt N will get put me back into the find box. So I want to find carrot 0146 and a closing single quote left parenthesis, left square bracket, capital A hyphen, lowercase z, square bracket, close parenthesis, right parenthesis. I'll tab, I'll put a tab to the replace with box. And I specify carat 39, which is a straight apostrophe. By doing that, Dutch uh, Word will not apply the smart quotes to, to this. It'll replace it with a straight apostrophe. Backslash one means replace, replace what, what, whatever was in that, whatever letter had followed. Replace all, Alt A, and we've made 24 replacements. I'll scroll down and I've just highlighted on the screen, we've got apostrophe capital E, E, short for he, and it is a straight apostrophe. It has changed 24 of those. Our second one, our next one is, is of course the common one, the S apostrophe at the end of a word. Again, control H. We can switch off our wildcards now. We don't need them anymore. So that's Alt U to switch off the wildcards. Alt N to go back to the find what, what box. And replacing S apostrophe. We don't have to be specific, but we have to replace it with S carrot 39. We, so the replace has to be specific. The search doesn't have to be specific. The replace does have to be specific. Alt A to replace all, and we made three, three replacements. So that takes us through, so we now have straight apostrophes. The second step is, the second thing that we do is swap our single and double quotes. And there are four steps to this. And it's, this is best done with a macro, which is easy to write. The first step is to open is to replace the open single quote with a with a placeholder. I use four percent signs. Percent, 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 percent. We then replace all, all the instances of a closing a single quote with the placeholder. We then replace all double quotes with single quotes. And then we replace all percent, percent, percent with a double quote. This does not touch any of the apostrophes that we defined in the previous set because we, because in our, in our searching, we were specific to the open and closed single quotes, not the straight apostrophe. I'm going back to our document. Find and replace, control H. We want to find carrot 0145 is the ASCII for the open single quote. Tap to the replace box, 
percent, 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 replace all. 21, 21 replacements. In our find box, carrot 0146, which is the closing single quote, again, replace with percent, 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 percent. Alt A, replace all. We've made 23, 23 replacements. Okay, so now we replace in the find what box, double quote, replace with a single quote. We don't need to be specific about which one. Duxbury uh, Word, even if we try to be specific about what we replace with, Word still applies its, Word thinks it knows better than we do about direction. So we don't, we just let it do its own thing. So if we're finding double quote, replacing with single quote, replace all, 19 replacements. Finally, we find all instances of percent, 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 and replace it with a double quote, Alt A to replace all, 44 replacements. So we now have a document where the double quotes are at the beginning of, of where you want them to be. We have swapped the doubles with the singles, but maintaining the apostrophes that we had defined. I'm going to show now, and this is for our sighted people, my apologies for those who can't see the screen, but a tool that I use as a sighted transcriber is adding colour. By adding colour, it makes a visual search through a document really easy to work out what is a double quote, what is a single quote, what is an apostrophe, to see whether things are in the right place. So the first, so if I go to my home tab, choose, choose your highlighting and select yellow for my highlighting, I go control H, find and replace. I want to search for all instances of double quote, replace with, make the box empty, but you go down into the bottom here, there's a little format box, alt op opens that up, and at the bottom of the list is highlight. So alt O, highlight, highlight, and if you notice, under the replace with box, it says it's going to replace that with highlight. If I replace all, 44 replacements, and you will see on my screen that all the double quotes have gone yellow. I want to change my highlight colour to turquoise. It's a light blue. Find all single quotes. Replace highlight. Replace all. And finally, change my highlight colour to green. Find, and I want to find all the straight, my straight quotes with a highlight, replace all. So now on my, you can see, I'll scroll down to where you can see the three different colours. So I've got yellow, double quote, U, green apostrophe, ERT, U-R-T, me, I, yellow double quote, ERT, you like damn, blue single quote, yellow single quote. It gives a really good, I find this really useful for proofreading, is to use colour. The final step and um, we never get away from this, is proofreading for manual correction. I'm sure that as um, artificial intelligence gets better and whatever, there are ways of minimising a lot of these things. But, you know, sort of we never get away from checking through for manual 
detection. So I'm going to start at the top of the document. And as I'm looking down, I can see, oh, I've now got single quotes around the words. I've got extracts from Watership down because I'd used double quotes initially when I typed that. I'll change those to double quotes. In a large document, I will often use a search for um, the search feature of search for all instances of a single of a of um, of something. But I'm going to do this manually as I go. We've got a wrong after you share your whole with. Rab scuttle, full stop, single quote, double quote. The double quote is the wrong direction. I can type it in and get the correct direction. Duxbury doesn't really matter on that, but my pedanticness does. And we often, because we often use um, the same file for large print as for Braille, I like to be pedantic that I get my quotes and apostrophes co looking correct. We've got a wrong direction. We've got a dash, quote, yark, yark. We want to change that to a double quote. You need to put a space, double quote. Sometimes you've got to play to force it. So we come down here. What for help me? With a double quote in front, that should be that should be an apostrophe. Type it, Control Z to make it straight, and delete the incorrect one. Very easy to make it straight. That will now translate as an apostrophe. The ones, the words which originally had a closing single quote in front of them are fine. The ones which had an opening quote in front of them are not. I urge you like Dan, this is, so as you go through, this, this one's a quite a tricky, tricky document. And it would have been that it wouldn't, Normally, you wouldn't get a mix of apostrophes correct and apostrophes incorrect because you'd normally get um, this uh, consistency in a document. Sometimes not. Teachers do interesting things at times. Classroom teachers, that is. So that's gone through and... But he was. There's an instance where but he was, that's correct. It was a double quote, single quote, but he was closed, single quote. So I'm going to put that to the side. So if I now go to my Ducks Free file, open that document, if I just highlight that particular set of Bus, bus quote is rope on the right hand side in the Duxbury. We've got open quote capital bust apostrophe IS for his rope and apostrophe. All of the apostrophes and the quotes have come through correctly with and still having a And still having um, a thing. So, so we looked at proofreading for manual correction. I changed the quotes around watership down to double quotes. Looking for the beginning and end of quoted passages, making sure you've got, you know, they're balanced. However, in, however, in this passage, because you've got a series of of uh, paragraphs where the same person is talking, there isn't always the end, the end quote for the passage, but it is still, right. 
there was the direction of a closing quote, checking for the direction of, of quotes in interesting positions, often where there's two quotes together or after a dash and that. And then various apostrophes at the beginning of words, having to double check those. And the, and yeah, the direction of the closing single quote after a dash. That is what you still never get away from manually changing. And that's, you know, sort of, I think that's, but that's always been the way. So we opened it in DBT. The passage now reads correctly using correct quotes and apostrophes. The first quote encountered is a double quote. So they, it all, trans, they all translate as the one cell quote as per 764. If after having done after having done this and you, you say, but I really actually want my document to be, to have the single quote as the outside quote and the double quote to be the in, inside quote, you can go through exactly those same search and replaces which swap the single and double. You can do that again, it'll swap them back but it still won't change, but your apostrophes will still be apostrophes. So if, if you do want to actually use the single quote as your, as your uh, most common quote, you do that, but then you also need to put that UOQ code at the beginning of your document, if the single quote is the one that is going to be first encountered. So I find that for proofreading, checking my work, swapping, using double quotes as the main quote makes checking a lot easier. Once you've got that done and your apostrophes, if you did want to go back to having single quotes, quotes as the most dominant, you can swap them back just replaying that process. How are we going for time? Not bad. Okay. A quick look at exceptions. There is, um, from the updated rules, there is how to handle non-directional double quotes. Now, this is only in, in the context where it is important that it is shown as a non-directional quote. Like it might be a typing keystroke or whatever. And the example I've used, which is straight from those rules, is the rejects pattern. So you've got a quoted passage, straight double quote, question mark, plus a string in square brackets, straight quote, and then the closing directional quote of single quote, double quote. There is a code UCL1 tilde double quote, which actually says, all double quotes should be straight, and then you convert back to UCL zero tilde double quote. So the string that you would put in is you put your UCL one um, tilde double quote code before you want want your straight ones, and then after the last one to switch it off. The second, the second example that I've used is where you've got a quoted section within a word which doesn't begin at the beginning of the word. So the example in the, in the rules were Francis, F-R-A-N-C, double quote, E, double quote, S. The rules say that a double quote that is that does not begin a word needs to have its two cell form, the four five double quote. And it's and its closing form should match the opening form. Duxbury does not Duxbury will do the opening form but does not use the two cell closing form. So therefore you've got to add that little character Q tilde Q tilde carrot as a code and that will force the four or five before the quote in that. And I can show that as a, 
So here's my Word file. You can see um, I'm using here the feature that Duxbury has that you can put Duxbury codes within a Word document. I've, I've got them in, in orange that they stand out and Duxbury will read it. So you've got exactly what I read out then. So you've got for Francis, F-R-A-N-C, double quote E, the, the code for with the tilde, Q tilde, carrot, end quote, S. And if I find my Braille thing, if I open that in Braille on the other side, Translate. The first example is without the codes. So we've got, and we get, and it, it just does the double quotes, which are straight as, as the non-straight version, the, the open and closed version. The second one where I've put in the, put in the code. So you've got single quote, in there is the code UCL1 tilde, and then it's used the straight double quote, which is a dot six lower G. So that is, and that. And then we've got Francis without, without putting, without any codes, F R A N C four five open quote E close quote S, putting in that Q tilde carrot character, we've got F R A N C open four five open quote E four five close quote S, which is correct to the rules. Again, transcribe it intervention, but it is really important. So that that finishes what I've got to uh, display and whatever. So thank you. We we will have time for questions coming up now but uh, but we would love your suggestions on topics for future workshops so your contact it should be aba at braillaustralia.org i did i did check i did change that i kind of saved it with your suggestions thank you i will say thank you leona Thank you, Leona, for setting up the Zoom and handling all the registrations and, and all the other things that she does in the background. And thank you to Hattie for acting as a gopher and, and just keeping an eye on what's happening and, and the comments. So, time for questions. I'm going to... Please, do we unmute... Um, so I think everyone can uh, unmute themselves if you uh, have any questions to ask. We've had a couple of things in the comments. Um, but, yeah, people saying they love the colours. Um, and, yeah, differences with some people using uh, copying and pasting into Duxbury rather than using Word as the, um, yes. as the source file. So I'm certainly looking at at it being word used as a source file, not. But you know, all of these things can be adapted to what you um, to how you you work. So are are there any questions, comments, uh, or, or have I totally confused you all? <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> I'm happy to go back over anything that you might want. So Jody just asked whether the slides will be shared. Um, yes. Kathy can add to that. Yes, she says yes. <laughs> also yes but, 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 okay. Okay. The slides will be shared and um, updated on the notes that I that I distributed. I know Jody, thank you, picked up a couple of things on there, so I will um, Yes, they will be distributed, and so they, they they should be going up as part of the um, you know the whole the whole workshop thing. Yes, and um, they will 
the slides, we'll, we'll get a braille copy done of those as well for, for those of you who are a braille users. And I apologise any aspects that you may not have been able to follow along. I've tried my best, but it's um, it can be tricky. And it's really tricky given the fact that I've got no... Um, I'm talking to a blank screen, not to a group of people where you've got vibrant interaction. <laughs> so are there any other... So, so I'm going to assume that if you've unmuted yourself, you might have have a, a little question or a comment or something. So I'm wondering, uh, Jackie Sorensen, is there anything you want to add? No, I've got nothing to ask. I think I just need to go and try and digest all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, and really the best way to digest it is to do it, is, is to test it out. Yeah, I'm going to practice. <laughs> yeah, do some practice. Um, and, you know, sort of what I've talked about has taken a lot of, you know, sort of, it is actually um, me saying, oh, I wonder if, I wonder if, what happens if, mm. test it out, what yeah. will Duxbury do if, um, yeah. going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Um, it is, sometimes we do get stuck with saying, uh, because we're also busy, you know, uh, we've got to get things done quickly. We've got to get it done yesterday or the day before often. And I haven't got time to stop and play. You need to take time to stop and play at times just to... And, and, and you do increase your own productivity. One of the things I think that uh, moved me into this direction is, is the fact that we use... We are not Braille we are not Braille only in our production. We produce a lot of things which we do in Braille and large print and now EPUB and whatever. So we want, we don't want, we want to minimise the number of changes we need to make to a file to go between the different genres. And I don't like for large print, I don't like the uh, straight quotes, um, the angled quotes are much easier for for someone to read with large print, and and certainly the grave accent yeah. for for the single quote is totally inappropriate for large print. The other the other dilemma with using the grave accent, and I have an experiment to see what what Duxbury does, but there is the grave accent is a sim, symbol in itself which has its own braille coding. So we're actually using, through historic reasons, we're actually using a symbol which now actually has its own code. So that's... Um... So we've got one question uh, from Tristan Clare asking about um, uh, if, if this method is faster or not than... Um, than, than doing find and replace in Duxbury. And um, I think one of the advantages of doing it in Word is that you can assign it all to macros and have them as just buttons rather than having to type in those find and replace values um, every single time. Um, but I'm not sure if you've, if, if you've got anything to add to that or if Tristan has anything more to Yeah, ask. I think... Um... I haven't really sat down and and you know sort of uh, checked which one's faster, which one's not. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know from my perspective as a sighted transcriber, and I'm talking from that perspective, working in Word just gives me so much more, um, I think, control over what I'm doing. Control with search and replace. I can use, because we can use um, a lot stronger searches and replaces in Word than we can in Duxbury, like the wildcard search and replace. I can use, um, you know, uh, the trick with adding colour. That is, you know, sort of from my perspective, that is a really um, big, big thing that we use a lot of. As Hattie said, it's writing macros to do some of the these things which can do a lot of the um, 
you know, tidy up a whole lot of things before you even look at a file and you've got less things that have to be done. So it's, you know, sort of, it, it is, I think, uh, for me, working in Word is that. And I, and I also think that one of the other things with working in Word than working in Duxbury is that our Word document remains as our source document so that when we could make corrections, they're made in the Word document. And so all corrections are made in the one document, which then, which will have been made if we use that same document for Word for large print or whatever. We don't have to go back and, and say, oh, now what corrections did I make here? Do I have to make them there? We make the corrections in the Word document and that becomes our source document. Hi, Kathy. Christine Simpson. Hello, Christine. Long Hi. time no talk. <laughs> no, it's been quite a long time. Thank you for a very good presentation, another very good presentation, I have to say. Um, I may have missed something or misunderstood from what you said earlier when you were talking about working in the Duxbury file and using the UOQ code right at the very beginning to get yes the right yep. that, that was in the that dbt file you're talking about aren't you in the dxp That's file the dxp file yes right okay so you need to remove it from there even though it's a hidden code i think in that file um you can add it at if it if you do the uoq tilde Double quote, mm -hmm. add that to the top of your file, it will then use whatever whatever double quotes it finds in the file will make them single cell. Whatever single quotes it makes in the file will make two cells, regardless of which which is the first one that what that Duxbury comes across. And that's the UOQ tilde double quote. Double quote. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, Christine, that is actually, if, if, if that's the way you always want to work, that could actually be added to your initial, your initial uh, style. In fact, adding that to the initial style would mean that you always get, um, you won't get that two cell um, in, 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 incorrect double quote now, the four or five double quote, if that's an inner quote. Okay, any other questions? You're all silent. I've either stunned you all, bored you all, or <laughs> what? I don't know. Kathy, it's Leona. I think looking at the comments, there's a lot of people saying thank you very much, um, that there's things that they've learned that they need to now go home and try out. Um, if people do have follow-up questions, you're certainly welcome to continue this discussion online on the um, Osbrow list. Um, please do. And <laughs> in fact, please do. I think, you know, sort of the more discussion we have, the more we learn. Um, and I'm, yeah, you know, sort of, I think there's just so many and, and, and really can I encourage you to think about what other topics you, you would like to know more about more. And I think the more that we collaborate as a country, as a series, you know, sort of, or two countries, because we've got a number of New Zealanders here, which is fantastic. The more that we can collaborate on 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 how to, you know, how to do things, how to improve what we do, how to, you know, simplify what we do. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. E even in this time of um, distancing, I think it's forced us into looking at this online environment which I think is fantastic. It's, it's enabled some people to join a workshop who normally wouldn't have the opportunity at round table. So 
even with Roundtable happening again next year, I think continuing with the concept of some online workshops is also something to, to go with. So let Leona know what you would like to know more about. Even simple things. It can be simple, complex. We all share, you know, sharing is a fantastic way of going and seeing what people do. Kathy, Christine again. You made the comment a minute ago about had you stunned us all. I don't know that you've stunned us, but you have challenged us <laughs> to work really hard and to share the information that we find out for ourselves, to share that willingly, and to really work to get the, to make getting good quality braille um, easy or easier. And I think that's the important thing that these days we're getting so much braille and probably more um, inaccuracies in it than it ever contained. Because yes. it's so easy to get Braille these days. Mightn't be easy to get it correct and, and so on, but it's certainly easy to get a Braille copy. And people, so many people think, well, Braille's all the same. There's not good and, bra and poor Braille, there's Braille. That's right. The, the other thing that I think that um, is, is worth looking at with, with, with the concept of using some uh, macros, standard macros and things, is that a lot of stuff that students receive now, they'll get a Word document from a teacher, throw it into their Braille note, throw it into or throw it through Duxbury or something, if they are taught to use a simple macro which, which won't find everything, but it will clean up an awful lot, of, you know, it it will clean up a certain amount of of, of stuff before before it gets that. There, there are going to be less of those annoying errors that Christine was just talking about. You know, sort of this is not just about formal transcription. It's also actually looking at how can we make informal transcription a lot more accurate as well. And, and sometimes that, that might be that the end, you know, sort of the end user who, who receives an electronic file does their own cleaning up before they transcribe it to have a look at it. You know, sort of, there are lots of, yeah, there are lots of things to look at. And the quotes and apostrophes is, is a big one because we, because although, the, it is the one one symbol that goes against the Duxbury uh, goes against the UEB premise of a single a single um, print symbol a single braille symbol. We don't. We have the closing um, single quote is often used as a closing quote or an apostrophe, and we do show them differently. And so one of the things with transcription is how do we define them in the original document to make sure that the Braille is correct. Okay, do we have any last questions for Kathy? Unmute now if you do. No? Okay, so could everyone please join me in thanking Kathy? We can give her the air clap. <laughs> can you see everyone, Kathy? I think if you if you stop sharing, you need to your stop screen, sharing, and then we'll do the air oh, clap oh, together. Hold on, I've got to find my mouse. Stop share. I think I can. Okay. Yes, I can awesome. see. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> okay. Go gallery view. You can see everyone. Yeah. Um, okay, so for those who want to, um, please do hang around and we can have an informal chat because um, there are a lot of faces that we, we didn't get to catch up this year at Roundtable. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for your participation. Um, thank you for your ideas for future workshops. I've been getting messages and writing down lots of ideas. Oh, so. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and as Kathy said, she will share the workshop materials afterwards. It will be made available on the ABA website as well as through Ausbrail. Um, and we have recorded this session, so um, hopefully I'll be able to go back, clean it up and make that available as well. Okay.
So, Leona, mm -hmm. has anybody actually volunteered to host a workshop? No, but I've got <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. I, I will <clears throat>